Team Society. Uh, so without further ado, I will give our podium to our speaker. Okay. First of all, thank you, Dr. Zhang, for the kindly introduction. And thank you all for having me here. And uh, it's my great honor to share what, what we have recently done, you know, um, about uh, machine learning and differential policy, in particular in this special period, you know. Um, I think Dr. John mentioned uh, it give a particular advantage to non-local uh, speakers, uh, you know, you, we can participate in, uh, in this great event. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, differentially private distributed machine learning. Um, I think a major of the job is done by, by my PhD student, Mr. Jia Ding, and uh, uh, corresponding research collaborators. So uh, I really want to express my courtesy to all of them. So um, as we know, uh, nowadays we go to a big data era, right? So we have uh, billions of data here and there. I'm sorry, let me um, put my, yeah, the picture over there on the right corner so I can see the whole screen. So uh, we have uh, billions of zillions of uh, data generated by smartphone, IoT devices, whatever, right? So uh, all this big data actually um, wake up this kind of a uh, sleeping giant uh, machine learning or deep learning. Actually, that community has been sleeping for almost 30 years or more. But nowadays, because of uh, the big data, uh, it pushed uh, the, the machine learning and uh, deep learning things uh, into the front stage. So um, if we talk about machine learning and deep learning, the first thing jump on into our mind is um, probably the alpha go, right? So but actually deep, deep learning and machine learning include much more than that. Um, in general, we can classify that into centralized machine learning model like alpha go and like some other uh, important algorithm and applications. Also, we can have another category we call it the distributed machine learning model. So um, for example, distributed machine learning model also have uh, numerous applications. For example, if we talk about autonomous driving, right? So uh, if can, you consider every week or every car um, as a you know, machine learning edge or ends, then probably uh, collaboratively, they can train a model to learn, you know, probably what's the traffic accident uh, several miles away, uh, what's the potential traffic jam I'm gonna have in one hour, two hour or something, right? Another example uh, is probably the Google, the input prediction. So everybody use smartphone. Uh, when you want to input something, actually the machine probably can guess that, okay? Based on different, you know, different scenarios. So um, Google input prediction basically try to gather information. I mean, gather machine learning update from uh, every possible people's machine. Uh, or smart devices, smartphone. Then they train model, then they, turn, uh, they return the model back, uh, then you can use that to better predict what you want to input. There are some other examples uh, in healthcare, monitoring, remote uh, diagnosis, face recognition, and whatever, right? So, um, so we can say distributed machine learning compared to the centralized machine learning, they have several advantages. For example, takes them, um, very famous Google Fellow Learning, for example, um, they claim that, it's not they claim, actually some of them are, are true that the data can be owned by the user itself, right? We don't need to share the data. Only thing we need to share is the training model, okay? The model after local computing, after local training, you can exchange the model. And Google claim actually those model exchange, uh, update exchange is private. But in the community, we'll find actually it's not. So, um, I'm sorry, what's going on? Okay. We can say during the model exchange, there are potential attacks. Okay, there are potential attacks. Uh, in the next two slides, I'm going to talk about the model inversion attack and um, membership inference attack. Um, but before we talk about that, a very intuitive question is that um, why we need extra uh, security or privacy designs for that. Does existing techniques, for example, with the crypto-based, you know, encryption, decryption, can solve the question or not? Um, the general answer is no, because um, the traditional encryption, decryption, they only can protect the security during the transmission, okay? 
But after the results or output is released, they cannot protect that. However, if we talk about the model inversion attack, um, basically model inversion attack, they can um, reconstruct the training data from the output or and or the intermediate value, the intermediate model, or say the model updates, right? So uh, even purely based on the output, they can still reconstruct the, 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 the sensitive information in the training data. Here we show a very typical example. So I think in, in previous paper, uh, I didn't remember exactly the paper, but you know, they use it very often in the privacy community. So if you have original picture like that, you do the machine learning, then you got the model updates parameters. You, you got the um, label and outputs. From the label and outputs and the model parameters, I mean, the attacker can reconstruct some picture very similar uh, to the original training data, right? So that's the model inversion attack. Another typical attack we call it the membership inference attack. Um, general idea is from the same information output of the model up updates, uh, basically the attacker can tell if certain kind of guy or a certain kind of data is a member of a training data or not, or say is that data in the training data or not, right? So that's the thing, right? So, um, so that, that's uh, really push us to find some new techniques to preserve the privacy of machine learning. Uh, one of our most promising and popular approach Excuse me. It's a differential privacy approach. Um, put it in a very simple way, actually, differential privacy approach is we just adding noise in some critical part. For example, uh, on the objective function, on the output, or, or on the SJDs, um, whatsoever, right? So, um, but by adding noise, definitely the cost is we need to sacrifice the performance. We need to sacrifice the training utility. So I think when we design the privacy preserving machine learning, one very important goal is we try to design um, privacy preserving techniques for this kind of distributed machine learning. But at the same time, we want to still keep the model utility. We still want to keep the learning accuracy pretty high. Okay, that's the first, uh, first of our goal. The second thing is actually is, um, motivated by the model update itself. Um, if you consider the model update nowadays, the size of that model can be very, very huge. Okay, it can be um, dagabits or dagabits, um, you know, even some terabits model, uh, we also see that. Um, then the result to a question um, that, you know, nowadays communication probably is a bottleneck, uh, in particular for the scalability for large uh, distributed machine learning, right? So uh, I think another goal for our design is we try to design or develop this kind of a decentralized optimization method or distributed machine learning model. Um, but at the same time, we want to keep that uh, to be communication efficient um, and the privacy preserving. So based on those two goals <clears throat> in today's talk, uh, I'm going to present uh, three algorithms we developed Actually, yeah, three algorithms we developed. Um, uh, the first one is uh, private robust ADMM. Uh, it's targeted at differentially private machine learning, distributed machine learning. Um, the second one, we talk about the plausible private ADMM. Uh, we target at both the plausible because um, there is some ideal case when we consider ADMM for a machine learning, distributed machine learning, but we want to remove that assumption at the same time it will want to reduce the communication cost and the later two one qdp sjd one and two uh, we target out a uh, communication and differential private uh, decentralized machine learning okay <clears throat> let's move to the first um first thing we're going to talk about right um so here we target at um a machine learning algorithm a very typical one uh, we call it a ERM problem. It's a kind of empirical risk minimization. Um, this problem, the, the loss function is there, then um, it basically can solve by two approaches. The first approach, you can use a centralized stochastic gradient descent approach to solve that. But at the same time, uh, you can use a distributed one like the ADMM 
the alternating direction method of multiplayer based approach to solve that. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go to the detail of design of ADMM because um, you know, it's another very big topic. If I talk about that, probably I need to spend a, one hour or more, even more time uh, to talk about how to use ADMM to solve this kind of uh, optimization. How can we do the dual problem and solve things? So, uh, I mean, if you're not, if you want to get more information about ADMM, I think typically you can check um, Dr. Walter Yin's uh, book, uh, Dr. Walter Yin from a uh, math department at UCLA. And uh, I think um, Professor Zhi Quan Luo from uh, University of Minnesota, they, they, they're both experts in ADMM. They, they published several books related to that. Um, but general idea is we, we try to convert the original ERM problem to this mode, right? We, we have introduced some local variables. We have some auxiliary variables to do the decentralized way. And we want to talk about okay, if we want to solve that in the decentralized way, we want to exchange the intermediate update model, which part we need to add the privacy part in there, right? So, <clears throat> so like I mentioned in this slide, um, if the objective function is decoupled and each agent, they only need to minimize the sub problem associated with its own data, right? That's the most important part. Uh, in other words, you can decentralize the original ERM problem, optimization problem into every agent. Okay, every agent basically can solve a sub problem and, and um, with, with their own data and do some uh, update exchange with uh, the other agent or with the, the other nodes. What kind of information they need to change? Basically, is a primal update and do updates. It's a theta i t plus one and lambda i t plus one for the T plus one iteration, right? So basically, for example, theta one, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the network architecture here. Uh, if we consider distributed machine learning, ADMM, uh, it's under assumption that the network is connected. It's connected. That means you at least need to connect it to one neighbor. Okay, at least to one neighbor. You can be more, but at least to one, right? So the information you want to exchange with your neighbors um, is this kind of theta i t and lambda i t, okay? For t iteration, for t plus one iteration is something like this. So um, if we want to do the updates, basically you need to solve the optimization problem use, for example, if it's for t plus one iteration, you, you need a T's iteration theta i, that's the data, and um, lambda i for the T iteration, and also your neighbor's in, uh, information from this T iteration, okay? That means you need to exchange this theta information with your neighbor, okay? Based on those information, you can solve this optimization, get theta i t plus one. And based on theta i t plus one, you need your neighbor's information, then you can get lambda i t plus one. And based on this two, you can consider somehow we can solve the ADMM problem, all right? So, but the thing is we need to exchange theta information. We need to exchange lambda information, but how can we make it private, right? That's, uh, how can we make this procedure private? That's the most important thing we care about. So one quick question. Yeah. So yeah. in the model, uh, so every uh, participant just exchange the local model parameter with his neighbors, right? So the neighbors will not further forward the received information to uh, another neighbor? No, no. Yeah. Just need to exchange the information with the neighbor. Then, um, yes, yeah. So, um, if uh, we talk about how can we make the procedure private, we, we use, need to use the, the definition of uh, differential privacy. Uh, I, I know, I mean, this uh, special group, probably most of you guys are familiar with the DP, but you know, still I need to mention a little bit uh, for the preliminary. Um, so 
uh, differential policy in general, uh, we can use one sentence to say that basically we want to guarantee things statistically correct, but you cannot infer any kind of member's information, uh, particular one data, or one member's information. Um, there are several DP definitions. For example, it's just general epsilon DP and epsilon delta DP and some other DPs, right? So um, here in our in our works, uh, we, we use the uh, epsilon delta DP, okay? So uh, the general idea is to show in the, the following picture. Uh, for example, from um, one member, the theta uh, X and X, X1, X1 prime, if that one, that data participate or not, it's not gonna have very, very significant impacts on the final results in terms of the distribution, right? Um, but we allow certain kind of um, probability of failure, uh, that's the delta failure, you can consider the delta failure as um, the small jump out of the blue distribution over there, that's um, the failure distribution probability. So um, that's the general idea of epsilon delta DP. You have privacy budget, like, like just general DP definition. Also, you allow certain kind of probability of failure. Okay. So um, let's move on. Definitely, there are more definition about the sensitivity um, and uh, particular mechanism can, we can uh, add in noise to implement the epsilon delta DP. Uh, I think I can skip that, but I need to mention that we, we need to use a Gaussian mechanism to implement epsilon delta dp. Okay, so uh, some other general question like, um, sorry, uh, we can smaller sensitivity means less detoration, uh, detoration smaller epsilon means better privacy, small smaller delta means the less probability of failure. I, I think uh, it's exactly the same as the, uh, the dp definition. Oh, I need, okay. So um, we are not the first working on um, differentially private ADMM for machine learning algorithm. I think there's a um, preliminary work on that. Um, basically, we summarize that, uh, summarize the uh, state of art uh, related to our work. Um, in general, you can add noise on the primal updates. You can also add noise on dual updates. Right, there are several algorithms like a list over there. Um, but in summary, there are some, um, I mean, common drawbacks or disadvantage of, of this papers has. First of all, uh, most of them, they assume they have strong convex objective function, okay, to enforce the privacy guarantee. Um, some of the works, they cannot allow this kind of uh, decentralized architecture. They require a centralized server. Uh, just like uh, federal learning architecture, right? So uh, we're a little bit different, but you know, similar to that one. Um, so also, um, as we know, if we add noise, uh, the, the cost will, will be the performance loss, right? So in general, it's the convergence performance. They have a lot of a degradation of uh, convergence performance. So we try to address this issue and relax, uh, relieve um, this kind of uh, strong assumption like strong convex objective and, and so on and so forth. Um, so the idea is, you know, we still add the noise on the primal uh, updates. So we add the noise here, like we show um, in the, the, the right font uh, notations. And uh, following the post-processing properties of DP, if you add noise here, then we get um, a theta tile T plus one, and from theta tile T plus one, we can get a differentially private lambda T plus one. Okay, so following so, the- Quick yeah. question, actually two questions. So first yeah. of all, in order to apply the notion of defined privacy, so what's your definition of neighboring database here? Um, definition of a neighboring database. Yes, uh, a, a really question is, uh, in order to determine how much noise we need, uh, we need to add, we need to uh, analyze the air to sensitivity. So, I, I, so in general, uh, so I, I don't, I'm not sure how to, so because we are talking here, a quite general problem. 
So mm. I'm not sure how to analyze the L2 sensitivity in this case. Mm, that's a good question. I, I think uh, we assume um, that they follow the, I think they follow the ID data. So yeah, uh, but I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure um, in terms of data size, but I think we'll assume they follow the ID uh, distribution for the data. Okay. 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 Yeah. I mean, so that's also from one of our paper published in the big data last year. So I, I think um, this is, so the general idea is uh, similar to, oh, by the way, that's a very good question. I, I need to double check. I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's my dog. She, she does not like the technical discussion stuff. I think I need to train her more to like machine learning and uh, privacy. Okay, but, but anyway, um, I'm sorry, please forgive her. I uh, just, um, okay, sorry. So um, I, I think it's uh, similar to add noise on primal updates mm -hmm. in the general, but we use a very special, uh, very specific um, um, functions in terms of noise adding. We, what we call it is uh, noise decay schemes. Uh, the general idea is, uh, you know, at the beginning iteration, we add more noise. With more and more iterations, when the iteration is close to the convergence, we add less noise, okay? But we find a way, actually it's not a we find a way, we use the composition uh, theory of, uh, of DP then, uh, we use the rosy CDP and later I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, then we can put them together, add up them together uh, for overall, um, you know, privacy budget. So, but in general, you can say we use the decay scheme to do that. So, I mean, for later uh, iterations, the noise will be less than the previous iterations. Okay, will be smaller and smaller, but we, we develop a two kind of, um, decay scheme, one we call it a periodical linear decay, the other one uh, is iteration-based decay scheme. Just like we show the equation here. So um, that's the first trick we play. Um, the second trick we play is, uh, you know, um, we, we don't want to, because we, we don't want to easily trust your neighbors, right? Just for example, if I have a very bad neighbor, a very selfish neighbor, they just add arbitrary noise uh, to their, or say your neighbor is kind of our layer. How can you remove that? How can we avoid this kind of pollution or, or can, whatever you call it, right? It's just um, bad updates. How can you avoid that? Um, basically, we um, propose a noise degree checking criteria. You know, we just follow that equation. Um, if it's not too noisy, right, we just keep using the neighbor's model. We just exchange the model. But just in case, uh, for this round, if your neighbor is too noisy, add too much noise, you just uh, keep the last iterations, uh, your neighbor's model for the updates. You just don't use this current iterations. So basically, if you in introduce this kind of maximum, there's a two uh, advantage. Um, the first advantage is that you can avoid the badgenting attack. If uh, some of the, your neighbors is, uh, you know, compromised um, by badgenting attack, you can avoid them. Um, the other one is even your neighbor is uh, honest, but just um, consider your neighbor is kind of an outlier for the machine learning. Um, you can, you know, preclude his um, contributions. You know, you don't need the failures contributions from the majority, mm -hmm. right? So. You can you can avoid this two bad case happen. Um, so, but based on the two tricks we play over there, uh, we and the two decay scheme we're using, uh, we prove uh, we have privacy guarantee. Follow those equations. I don't want to you know uh, mention the detail of the proof, but you know that's the conclusion we have. Um, and also, we can. I'm sorry, this is a message. Um, we have, we use um, the row ZCDP, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we use the ZCDP to prove that we can uh, have a very tight composition over the iterations, just like I mentioned. For example, for iteration one, we have epsilon one, for iteration two, we have epsilon two, for epsilon 
uh, iteration t, we have epsilon t. The overall epsilon equals to the summation of uh, epsilon i, something like that, over the iterations. That's um, uh, the composition uh, property of uh, ZCDP. So um, we also give some uh, convergence analysis, like, like what we show about. Um, you know, if you forget about the equations over there, the general conclusion we can get is that, um, you know, um, the convergence rate is, um, is uh, one over T uh, in terms of order of one over T it is, a, is the same as a non-private decentralized ADMM. It's convergence rate actually is very, very good compared to the existing work, okay? So um, we also, did some experiments or simulation to verify that. Here's some uh, experimental setting up. Then basically this figure, uh, we show our advantage. Um, the PR ADMM is our scheme. We use uh, two decay um, DP adding, uh, adding functions to implement that. We can see compare with the existing DVP, R ADMM, M ADMM, like I mentioned in several slides before, um, actually our performance uh, is really good. That's the uh, bottom two line, two lines here. We zoom the figure over there. Uh, so basically, um, our convergence rate is good. Uh, our average loss is very small. So with different kind of uh, epsilon. Um, while it, we show similar performance for the training accuracy and testing accuracy, um, I think uh, our scheme outperform existing ones. That's the same, right? That's the first one. Um, Another question, quick question. So here, uh, what you have, uh, you can guarantee is the differential privacy guarantee for each uh, iteration, right? So individual. Oh. Um, I, that's a very insightful question. Uh, let me uh, say a little bit more about that. That's for T iteration, mm -hmm. okay? Um, T, you can predefine. Uh, pre for example, T is equal to 1,000, or say 10,000 or whatever. We can guarantee after T iteration, it can satisfy 30 epsilon, 30. Oh. Yeah, it's over T iteration. That's the reason why uh, I mentioned we use a um, composition theory mm -hmm. yeah. of the ZCDP because ZCDP is the, the, the good thing is you can add up each iteration's uh, epsilon mm -hmm. to the to the yes. big one after T iteration. Yes. Okay. okay. So next, let, let me move on to the possible private ADM. Okay. Um, like I mentioned, you know, uh, in previous uh, uh, works, we, we can add either the noise, um, sorry, let, let me quickly reply the image, I'm sorry. Okay, so you can add the noise either on the primal or the dual, right? So um, we can also consider that you, you add the noise on the output perturbation function or say you can add the noise on the objective function. But um, if you say those game are private, are differentially private, that's based on one assumption. That assumption is you have to solve the local sub-optimization problem of ADMM perfectly. You need to get the optimal solution so that you can derive corresponding uh, differential private uh, you know, results or whatever, okay? So all this privacy guarantee it based on that assumption, okay? But actually in reality, in practice, it's sometimes it's not achievable. You cannot solve the sub problem optimally in your local agent, right? Um, but how can we deal with that, right? So we think about probably we can approximately solve the per perturbed objective function uh, locally, and then we use the output perturbation to enforce privacy uh, of such kind of approximate solution, right? So just in case we cannot solve that perfectly, okay, we get an uh, approximation solution, but that approximate solution cannot satisfy whatever you call the post-processing 
property of DP or whatever, right? So you need to find a way to make that approximate solution to be differential piracy, okay? To, gar to guarantee the differential piracy from a theoretical point of view or from the, yeah, from theoretical point of view. So um, that's our major idea, okay? The reason why we call it the plausible, because um, like I mentioned, the optimal solution is not, it's not easy to get. Probably we need a, a approximate solution to do that and guarantee the DP. Um, so basically, um, our basic idea, we just added the Gaussian noise related to the maximum tolerable gradient norm of the perturbed objective in each ADM iteration. That sounds very weird, but you know, I just talk about that in a very simple way, uh, follow the steps here. Um, for original primal updates, it, it's the same thing, okay? We just uh, perturb the objective function here, make that open optimization is DP, and we use the uh, optimizer to get an um, approximate solution, okay? But we don't know this solution solved by the optimizer is um, DP or not, but we, we do want to guarantee our updates for the next iteration is DP, right? So we play a very small trick here, okay? So we think the next round, next iteration updates consist of the optimal solution of this perturbed objective function. That, that definitely is a DP because it follows the post-processing of DP. We add that, we minus that, okay? So we say this part is uh, differentially private. Then we want to guarantee this part in the bracket to be differentially private, okay? If we don't consider the, the right things right part over there, we want to guarantee this part to, to be differentially private. And this one is differentially private. This one, we are not sure. We just add a noise to this one to make it uh, differentially private. So basically, we just add another round of noise uh, on the on the optimizer's output, the approximation solution, right? So that's our idea. Um, so um, that's not too much to say, actually. Um, we just played that small trick, then uh, we would just introduce some other, I mean, T is a uh, old definition, is the total number of iterations, then beta is, um, uh, some new uh, no notation we introduced here means the optimization accuracy level. So similar thing, uh, we, we use um, the ZCDP, we use the composition property of the ZCDP and we put them together. We do a lot of um, theoretical analysis and we derive the privacy guarantee. But I think that's maybe not enough. Um, that's only make this kind of um, uh, private, differentially private ADM um, plausible, but probably that's not communication efficient, right? So we want to propose some other techniques to further improve that uh, to make it also communication efficient, right? So, um, so basically the general idea is we want to use SVT, the sparse vector techniques uh, to reduce the privacy at um, also, we try to make it communication efficient. So here, uh, just allow me to introduce the SVT uh, very briefly, okay? So what does it mean for SVT? Actually, it's, um, it's very easy. Uh, for example, you just consider, say you just consider this, um, this one as a SJD for the machine learning training, right? So if you're SJD, is larger than a certain kind of threshold, when people query, you send back the answer, okay? If your SJD is less than this threshold, that, that means you don't have much to update, then you don't send any answer, okay? Okay, say that's the first thing. The second thing is, say if your SJD for multiple iteration is cap uh, bigger than the, the, the threshold, for example, is bigger than the threshold for continuously um, 11 iteration, right? Then there is um, upper bound in terms of times you can answer the query. For example, the upper bound of, uh, of the account, you can answer the query is 10. So for the first 10 times, 
People query you, you give the answer. People query you, you give the answer. But for the 11th time, when people query you, you don't provide any answer. Okay, you just stop there. Okay, that means I make a, probably I made a enough contribution, I don't want to talk more. Okay, I don't want to give more information or something, okay. So basically we use this um, uh, SVT approach to further uh, improve our um, private, uh, plausible private ADM. Okay, so yeah. Um, here's a general idea. Um, the first step is similar uh, to the previous one. Then the second step, we, we just try to check the quality of current approximate solution. You know, we want to bind, when we do the clips, we want to bind the quality of the function from uh, this round to previous round, a uh, previous iteration, because uh, this can be arbitrarily large. So we have to clip them to um, refine them to a certain kind of range. So we do the quality check for the updates, just follow the SVT approach. Okay, uh, if it's good enough, we do that. And um, we also add the noise before we exchange that with the neighbor. Okay, we add the noise here. Okay, but if the update here, quality is very bad. Actually, it's nothing, not too much from the previous round. We just don't output anything. We don't, we don't send the information to the neighbors. Basically this round, this iteration, I don't have anything new to tell you guys. Okay, that, that's the thing. Also, like I mentioned, we only allow C times maximum during the, I, I mean, before the TC iteration, the total TC iteration we consider during the whole training process. Okay, we only, the maximum time you can, you can update, you can exchange the information with your neighbors is the C time from your part, you, you, from your contribution, right? So, um, Based on that, we also um, derive some privacy guarantee here and there. Then uh, we do some comparison with uh, PP ADM is possible private ADM in terms of privacy budget and communication cost. Um, we verify that uh, with, uh, with the simulation. Here we have some certain kind of parameter setup. Um, we can find that there's two, um, several so several things we find out. First of all, for the accuracy beta and the clip threshold C loss. When the beta, either beta is too small or beta is too large, actually um, it's not good. When the beta is too small, probably you need to solve a very noise objective function perfectly, but that may not help the convergence or may not help the overall uh, distributed machine learning. Okay, so that means, um, if your, your approximation is too far away from the optimal one, then probably, you know, you direct the, the, the whole things into wrong directions, right? So, um, when, but when beta is too large, you know, cause you wanna, uh, um, even beta, when beta is equals to one, that's perfect, right? But as long as beta is less than one, uh, you still, uh, want to guarantee your approximation is uh, private. So probably you need to add more noise there. So uh, either beta is too small or too large is not good. So there are some optimal value for beta, but here in our paper, we didn't find out. We just do some empirical uh, experiments to show the trend. Uh, similar things uh, happen to the C loss as well. Uh, here, we do some um, convergence analysis comparison. We also do some uh, um, testing error rate comparison under given privacy budget. Uh, we can also show that our PP ADMM and IPP ADMM is better than the existing one. If you check the left side figure, if you, in terms of um, under the same privacy budget, uh, our testing error is, is lower. Um, for the right figure, if you consider um, our scheme compared with the existing ones, uh, our average loss is the smallest one, okay? Uh, in particular, the improved uh, plausible private ADMM, we can further save some privacy costs and have better conformance, uh, con convergence performance because uh, we save a lot of uh, communication costs. And uh, we don't relate those kind of low quality 
uh, updates. Okay. So basically, that is the tool works. Uh, there are some takeaway uh, for privacy preserving uh, a robust ADMM. We use the noise decay function. We try to reduce the negative impacts of noise adding. Okay. For the PP ADMM and uh, uh, we, we use a noisy approximation solutions to, to make it a uh, plausible, feasible. Uh, we don't need to go for the optimal solution for local computing. And IPP ADMM, we use SVT to check the quality of the updates and uh, we improve the utility and reduce communication cost. So any question before I go to the next one? So I can directly go to the next one. I, I, I know probably I need, I need uh, 10 minutes or, or around to for the next one. Yeah, I just go through it, then we can uh, keep the question for the, uh, after the presentation, okay. So um, the other two, some other two things uh, we develop here, we, we consider the challenge of a uh, struggling agent. Basically, uh, certain agent, uh, they're going to slow down the overall uh, performance or updates. They run really slow for local computation. So um, we just want to find a way to get rid of that. Um, and uh, also uh, we want to address the communication load uh, issues. We want to keep the communication efficiency, just like we were mentioned, also privacy concerns. So we want to develop a robust communication efficient and the privacy preserving schemes. So, I mean, this page generally show our idea, how can we do that, right? So first of all, we propose a deadline-based gradient computation, right? Um, for the local gradient computation. I mean, if you compare to the left side of the figure is a mini, mini batch DSGD that's approaching the literature. <clears throat> Basically it's a synchronized um, learning, uh, collaborative learning. Then you need to wait the, the, the slowest, or say we call it struggling agent to finish the local computing, then you can begin next round. Okay, compared to that, uh, we set up a deadline. Okay, but the, the, uh, for, for the first one, I only mention one more sentence that actually there is a comparison in terms of uh, mini batch DSJD and uh, in synchronized uh, DSJD. Actually, mini batch has a little bit, if I remember correctly, has a little bit better performance than the in synchronized one. Um, for the deadline best, we just set up a deadline. Okay, when the deadline coming, just like the paper deadline, proposal deadline, whatever you finish or not, you need to submit, okay? So, so uh, that's the- uh, Okay, I'll, so uh, if I, uh, if, as a participant, if I uh, cannot finish before deadline, what should I submit? Uh, you just, um, I, I think submit the last round or something, okay? Or submit whatever you, you, you have finished, okay? So basically we don't need to wait for you until you finish, okay? So we just give you up or something, okay? But I, I think later I'm gonna mention in, in the detailed scheme design. So for the heavy communication load, um, uh, what, one more thing we can consider is we use a quantization to do that, okay? I mean, that's very typical. Um, we use a quantization to make the communication efficient. Uh, I mean, for the privacy, here is another problem we need to consider. I think the major problem we consider for privacy design is when we do the quantization, should we add the noise before or after random quantization, right? That, that's the question, okay? And what's corresponding performance for that? So um, that's a general problem setting is uh, we try to address the stochastic learning model. Uh, first of all, we discretize that uh, to make it a ERM problem. Uh, definitely there is certain kinds of loss, right? So there is a gap between this ERM and uh, the general stochastic learning um, optimization solution uh, that, that, that can be quantified by certain kind of metric or regression afterwards. Uh, and uh, for the ERM, we can further decompose that to the collaborative learning problem and distribute that to the N agent for distributed machine learning. There is uh, no uh, optimality loss from the ERM to the collaborative learning model. Um, so here basically we set up a deadline. The deadline is a T, TD, right? So if you consider the downline TD here, uh, the VIT is the training speed, right? So SIT is a finished data set, data size. Okay, that means within TID, 
whatever, how much you can finish, you just contribute what whatever you can finish. And based on that, we get a SGD, okay? Uh, we get the gradient descent. So uh, that's the first thing. Um, for our first QDP SGD1 scheme, we added the noise after quantization. So basically for the data, X, the local data you have, we quantize that to get a ZIT and we broadcast that ZIT to the neighbor. And um, for the updates, you add the noise, they hear the noise. For the SGD, you get the next round XIT plus one, okay? So my question, if you yeah. add the Gaussian noise, like it's a continuous uh, random variable to uh, quantize the model parameters, uh, then you lost the benefit of quantization, right? Because you, again, increase the precision of the data. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's right. Um, actually, my second scheme is going to address that. Okay. But uh, here is you add noise first and you do quantization afterwards. So that's not going to lose the benefit that you mentioned. But you're right. If you do the quantization first and you add noise afterwards, you're going to lose that. But I'm going to mention that. That's a very, very, very good question, actually. This, um, I think we convert it at a certain point. Right? So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through this one. Um, so we can prove a certain kind of privacy guarantee, okay? So um, if there is no more updates, nothing to updates, then you don't need to uh, sacri sacrifice any kind of privacy budget. You still update, but, you know, there is nothing to hide, okay? So um, then we do uh, several analysis for the non-convex uh, loss, uh, strong convex uh, situation. Also for the strong convex situation, we measure the um, uh, population risk. That basically that's um, the collaborative lear learning model, uh, the gap from that to the general stochastic learning model, what, what is uh, the gap you, uh, you measure that by the population risk. The second approach we address Dr. John's question, actually, uh, if you think about the challenges, that exactly like a question Dr. John asked. If uh, you add noise after quantization, then um, you know you just lost the benefit of the quantization, right? So probably um, you know after quantization is kind of an integer number. After you add a noise, it becomes the real number again, right? So um, so we, we consider. Instead of using general Gaussian noise, we use a discrete Gaussian with arbitrary precision, right? So basically we consider the resolution and the precision of the quantization, and we adjust a certain kind of parameter to add the noise over there. Okay, that, that's the general idea. I think by seeing that, that's probably almost all the things we have done here, you know, uh, the only difference is we just add the noise afterwards, after the quantization, if you pay attention to step two, okay? Um, for the rest of it, I think there's not too much. There's just some adjustment of parameter uh, due to limited of time. I just skipped that. Um, I think we also proved that in the strong convex uh, situation. And uh, we get the, um, uh, one more interesting thing is that actually um, QDPSGD1 is um, better than QDPSGD2 in terms of um, population risk. Uh, that, that, that means in terms of uh, uh, loss to the optimal solution, I mean, QDPSGD1 is better than QDPSGD2. So we do uh, some simulation. Uh, we do some comparison with the existing algorithm like uh, DSGD and uh, SDM. Um, DSGD does not use any kind of quantization or compression, but SDM, you, they, they use certain kind of um, compression uh, techniques. So um, you can see from the figure that um, basically our algorithm we can um, we can outperform the baseline algorithm, existing algorithm in in terms of uh, total running time because uh, our algorithm is communication efficient. And um, um, besides, if you compare with uh, QDPSGD one and QDPSGD two. One is better than two in terms of uh, performance loss. Uh, like I mentioned, the population risk of um, uh, DPSGD1, QDPSGD1 is better than, than the second, right? 
Um, here we use a different epsilon, we evaluate that. Uh, we also conduct simulations for large networks and say our scheme works for the large network as well. Um, we also compare the, the performance of different algorithms with the large batch size. So basically our algorithm works for the large uh, batch size uh, situation as well. But general, you know, if you use a larger uh, batch size, the general conclusion is uh, they can further reduce the loss, but definitely they consume more training time. So finally, we go to the conclusion. I, 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 will, I consume a lot of time for the presentation. So first of all, we propose uh, the differential pilot ADMM-based distributed machine learning algorithm. Then um, basically our contribution is we have several noise decay schemes. We outperform um, a, a noise approximation solution to make it feasible and plausible. We also uh, adopt SVT to save the communication cost and uh, for, for to attack the quality of uh, approximation solution as well. Also for the two QDP SGD algorithm, we can robust, uh, we can achieve robust communication efficient and uh, privacy preserving decentralized machine learning. I think um, that's all. Thank you everyone. Let's thank our speaker first. <laughs> I think we have time for some questions. Any questions from audience? Um, 